Good evening, everyone. I'm Debbie Hilbesell, and tonight is Sunday, November 13th, and we are going to do case list review again tonight. So again, have how to participate. There's a little orange arrow in the upper right hand corner of your screen that will open and close your panel in case you need to move it in order to see what I have up on the screen. Um, looks like everybody's using mic and speaker, so you don't need to do anything. But if you actually had to phone in, you just click on use telephone, you'll get a phone number, access code, and a PIN. And then when it comes to um, asking for volunteers, you will just raise your hand and then I'll be able to call on you. The, um, you currently are all muted on your end, so I will unmute you on my end, but just make sure that you're, uh, when I call on you, you are unmuted on your end such that the little microphone underneath the orange arrow is green. All right, so with regards to doing the case list review, I, I always like to start out with just a couple of quick little pearls. And so I'm gonna maybe take the first five minutes of tonight and then go over just a little bit of information about endometriosis. So there have been some changes in endometriosis prior to this new update that came out in 2022. Um, the treatment was a little bit, eh, not so much the treatment was different, but the recommendations were different. And we really considered, you know, the gold standard of how to diagnose endometriosis, be the laparoscopy, et cetera. But let's just take a quick look at some endometriosis information. So it's a chronic condition that has a plethora of presentations, not only in the way that lesions look, but most also very importantly in different signs and symptoms. The most important symptoms of endometriosis include pain and infertility. And when we think of endometriosis as a disease, think of it in terms of, it's kind of subdivided into type and location such that you've got the peritoneal lesions and those would be the very superficial ones. You have the deep infiltrating endometriosis, and then you have endometriomas. Now, I know you're not going to be able to read this, but this comes right from this um, organization. It's the, I don't even know what it stands for, the ESHRE, but they're an a international organization on endometriosis. So here's, let's take a look at this. Let me walk through it for you. So signs and symptoms. If women have any of these symptoms, you should consider the diagnosis of endometriosis. Dysmenorrhea, deep dyspareunia, dysuria, dyskesia, painful rectal bleeding, hematuria, shoulder tip pain, catamenial pneumothorax, cyclic cough or hemoptic hemoptysis, I can't speak today, chest pain, cyclic scar pain and swelling, fatigue and infertility. So all of those symptoms should make you be thinking or any of those symptoms to be thinking of a diagnosis of endometriosis. So in order to explore that diagnosis better, you're going to do a pelvic exam plus imaging that could be either an ultrasound or an MRI. The most important thing to remember right here is negative imaging does not rule out endometriosis and biomarker testing is not recommended like with CA-125s, et cetera. So anyway, so the patient has symptoms, you're going to do a pelvic exam, you're going to get imaging. So what are some different things you can do? Well, this is like if you come up with a different a different diagnosis, well, duh, you'll follow it up. If they get some other kind of a mass, you're gonna follow it up. But let's focus on the middle here. Let's say there actually are signs of endometriosis. She has an endometrioma or something like that. You're going to proceed to treatment or you could either explore the presence and the extent of the infiltrating disease in the endometrioma possibly do additional imaging. So that's how you would walk down this way. What if you suspect endometriosis by signs and symptoms, you get imaging that may very well be negative. You could go ahead and based off of your suspicion, do empirical medical treatment. If it's unsuccessful or the patient is, has, um, is inappropriate for choices of medical treatment, then you need to consider um, exploring the possibility that she has peritoneal endometriosis, 
You could do a diagnostic laparoscopy at that point in time and combine this with surgical treatment and you can confirm it with histology. And I'll, I'll go over that a little bit. The point here is if you're going to do a diagnostic scope for someone with pelvic pain and you see endometriosis, then you should not just look and say, oh, you have a diagnosis of endometriosis. What you should do is treat the endometriosis while you are there. And you do have to remember, and I know a lot of candidates say, well, you know, it looked like she had endometriosis, but I did a biopsy and it came just back fibrosis and scarring. Um, negative histology does not rule out endometriosis. And if you clinically see endometriosis, even though your biopsy didn't prove it, you can call, you can make the diagnosis of endometriosis. And of course, empirical treatment, basically the first line treatment are combined OCPs or progest, or the progestogens in, in the GNR H uh, antagonists and agonists are considered second line therapy. So basically, um, this kind of just goes through what I already talked about. So if any of you go come back later and look or listen to any of these webinars, that remember a negative finding on ultrasound or MRI does not exclude endometriosis, especially the superficial peritoneal kind. And so then if you have negative imaging, um, results or where empiric treatment was unsuccessful or inappropriate, you can do laparoscopy. And well, I already covered all that. Okay, so does diagnostic laparoscopy compared to empirical medical management result in better symptom management on patients of endometriosis? So basically, if you suspect endometriosis and you just go ahead and treat her, if you had done a diagnostic scope first, would she be better off? And there's no evidence of superiority of either approach. And so they say either diagnostic laparoscopy and imaging combined with empiric treatment can be considered in women suspected of endometriosis. And you just need to talk to the pros about the pros and cons. Some of our patients absolutely say, all right, I've already tried one thing. I'm not going to keep taking things unless I know what's really going on. And other patients may be very comfortable with trying different therapies. What about pain? How are we going to treat the pain of endometriosis? So you NSAIDs are always going to be offered as first line. They can be taken alone or in combination with other treatments. You can do hormone treatments. And again, we've talked about OCPs and progestogens are first line. Second line are the GNA, GNRH agonist antagonists. And actually for totally refractory disease, they're actually giving aromatase inhibitors. That, that's basically a third line treatment. So really, in of the, any of these threes are considered acceptable. We do know when you go in and do surgery and obliterate disease, that helps pain. But if you do that, you should consider giving her post-op hormone treatment unless the goal is immediately to attempt conception. All right, so we, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I didn't cover here. Um, Probably not so much that we used to back in the, if you look at the 2014 recommendations, they still talk about laparoscopic uterosacral nerve ablation. That is no longer recommended and has not shown to be effective. Um, oh, I guess we covered that. Oh, what about if a hysterectomy? Say you've failed everything. Um, you, you've tried all the different hormone management, medical management, clinicians, you can consider a hysterectomy with or without removal of the ovaries, with removal of all visible endometriosis lesions. So if you're going to go in there and do surgery for definitive management, don't just take out her uterus and her tubes, but you should get rid of every visible endometriosis lesion you can see. And of course, that's for patients who no longer wish to conceive and have failed more conservative therapy. They, women should know that hysterectomy will not necessarily cure the symptoms or the disease, that they could still get um, recurrences. And if should you take out the ovaries or not, you need to talk about the long-term consequences of early menopause and the possible need for hormone replacement therapy. 
if you are going to do a hysterectomy, you shouldn't plan on doing a super cervical. A total hysterectomy is preferred. And if you were to give hormone therapy to someone for, um, post-operatively for treatment of endometriosis, this is the one case where estrogen plus progesterone is recommended, even though there isn't a uterus in place. Um, and then for patients, if you're doing lap laparoscopic treatment for pain, it is recommended that post-op you um, prescribe uh, hormone therapy afterwards unless they desire pregnancy. In the olden days, we used to pre-treat with hormone therapy and then do surgery thinking it would improve the outcome and that has not shown been shown to be the case. We know the uh, prevalence of endometriosis is about two to 10% of the female population, 50% of infertile women, and 70 to 90% of patients with chronic pelvic pain. They, the thing to remember is it can look a whole lot of different ways. And I'm surprised when I do the my mock oral, some of the candidates are not aware of this. They'll talk about the classic gray powder burn re, um, lesions, the dark pigmented lesions that have hemosiderin deposits, but they're not aware of just the little clear vesicles and blebs that can be on the, on the peritoneal surface. You can get little red flame lesions. You can just see kind of white scarred lesions also. And all of those are um, indicative of disease. So how does endometriosis cause pain? Well, there's three different theories. One is by the production of substances such as growth factor and cytokines that contributes to the whole inflammation process. Then there may actually be a direct and indirect effect just from the active bleeding of the implants. And last but not least, the deeply infiltrating lesions may truly irritate the nerves in the pelvis. One of the things that can be very helpful on pelvic exam is feeling for um, uterosacral ligament nodularity. And when you have tenderness in the cul-de-sac or you can feel nodularity and tenderness of the uterosacral ligament, it is very sensitive and specific for infiltrative endometriosis. All I'm saying is it's one of the few clinical signs when you're doing a pelvic exam that is really going to help push you toward the diagnosis of endometriosis. And oftentimes these patients will have symptoms of deep dyspareunia and severe dysmenorrhea. And then of course we know the intensity and character of the pain rarely correlates with the severity of the disease. And same thing with pelvic exams. Although we can be curious or um, not curious, we can be suspicious for endometriosis based off of this uterosacral ligament nodularity and tenderness. It, we, really, it, we are gonna be clueless of the extent of the disease. Um, operative visualization of characteristic lesions is an acceptable surrogate for excision with histologic diagnosis. So again, a lot of the candidates say, you know, I don't know what to, I'm supposed to do. I did a biopsy. It didn't come back endometriosis. I'm like, okay, well, what did you see? Did it look like endometriosis? Yes, it did. Okay, she has endometriosis. And so you treat her for it. Used to be for a while, we thought that if you gave somebody with chronic pelvic pain that you suspected endometriosis, you could give her a GnRH agonist for three months and you gave it solely to basically diagnose and treat the endometriosis without doing a laparoscopy first. And the thought was, well, if they get better, it's gotta be endometriosis, right? And they found, uh, don't do that because pain was reduced both in women with and without endometriosis. So you're not going to use it for a diagnostic treatment. You could use it for therapeutic if that's what you want, but don't look at response to a GnRH agonist as proof that somebody has endometriosis. And then of course, you've got to rule out all the other causes for chronic pelvic pain in patients who have endometriosis, especially those who failed to respond to um, traditional medical therapy. What about treatment of endometriomas? Do not just IND them. Um, if you do that, there's an 80 to 100% recurrence by six months. You need to do a cystectomy 
understanding that when you are doing that, you can be removing some normal ovarian tissue and there can be a decrease in ovarian reserve. And they've studied this by looking at AMH levels postoperatively and seeing a decrease. But both medical and surgical treatment for pain are effective. If again, if you do a scope for somebody with pelvic pain, if you see visible endometriosis, treat it. Um, and surgical treatment followed by medical therapy gives longer symptom relief than surgery alone. We've already walked through the different um, medications. How do they kind of work? OC, OCP is either cyclic or continuous with continuous being better. Basically it causes a decidualization of the implants and then an atrophy of them. Progestins do exactly the same as this. Plus, there's a few other things. One, it may suppress this certain enzyme called matrix metalloproteinase that, that this enzyme increases the growth and implantation of ectopic endometrium. So progestins suppress that and suppress progestins also inhibit angiogenesis. And then with the GnRH agonists, they basically bind to the pituitary gland. They have a longer half-life than native GnRH, so they cause a down-regulation of the pituitary ovarian axis and cause hypoestrogenism. And then with um, Elagolix, the GnRH antagonist, again, that's a second line therapy for moderate to severe endometriosis. There's two different doses, so you should know about those. This higher dose is the dose that has actually been shown to reduce dyspareunia, but all of us, I think, pretty much are going to start on the lower dose first. Um, they, patients must use contraception when they are on Elagolix or Elagolix or Elagolix. I've heard it pronounced all three ways. Um, However, it should not be estrogen containing. We don't really have any good data of using a progestin OCP. Does that interfere with effectiveness? So as a minimum, to be on effective non-hormonal contraception. And then contraindications to it, this include uh, already an established diagnosis of osteoporosis, obviously if they're pregnant, severe hepatic disease, and there's if you, they are taking a medication that is or an organic anion transporting polypeptide 1B1 inhibitor. And that's a mouthful. And I had to even look up what they meant by that. So here's what here's here's just an example of some of the different medications. Most of these are nothing that well, that that's um, an antibiotic. Uh, but most of these are not there's another antibiotic that's a rarely used cholesterol lowering agent. But anyway, just know there's a list of medications that are these OATP inhibitors. All right, so that's your endometriosis in, in a nutshell um, today. All right, so what I'd like to do is I'm gonna lower everybody's hand and I'd like to ask anyone who has not gone yet in November, but who would like to, to please let me know. And I'm trying to get out of my PowerPoint. Let me see here. And close this out. And let's start with Angela. Hey, Angela. Hey, Angela. Angela, I don't know why I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Hello. Hello, can you hear me?
Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Angela, I'm gonna, can you hear me oh. now? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, could you hear any of the lecture I did? Uh, I did. I don't know okay, what happened good. when I unmuted myself. Okay, because I was like, oh my gosh, don't tell me I was been babbling for 15 minutes and nobody heard one thing I said. No, oh my no, God. Long. it was a good lecture. Okay, okay, good. All right, because I was like, uh, endometriosis has just undergone some changes and I just wanted to quickly go over with you guys some points. <laughs> okay, so are you a generalist or a subspecialist? Uh, I'm a subspecialist. Okay, and what's your subspecialty? Uh, I'm an REI fellow. All right, so do you have a particular case list that you would like to do? No, any of them will be good practice at this point. Okay, let's see here. So are your GYN from your residency or did you try to put some of your fellowship? Maybe you got enough REF stuff with your fellowship, huh? Yeah, I, I use the fellowship cases. All right. All right, let's look at patient number 16. This is a 38 year old who came to you with um, 38G0P0 with primary infertility. Um, <clears throat> I know you're gonna know how to answer this, but it would be good review for um, all the generalists out there too. When somebody presents to you um, with primary infertility, just briefly tell me how you counsel them about the different causes of infertility and how you're going to evaluate for those causes. Sure, um, so I typically um, explain to my patient um, kind of a structural approach to the, the diagnosis that I have in mind. So uh, typically I explain to them that there could be an age-related uh, effect on ovarian reserve. Um, there could be a tubal factor and fertility with blocked or uh, 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 blocked uh, fallopian tubes. Then there could be a uterine factor with uh, either um, structural abnormalities like uh, endometrial polyps or fibroids or sometimes even malarian uh, anomalies. Um, and then uh, that's typically the things I cover on the female side. Um, and then obviously 30 to 50 percent of the time uh, there's a male factor in infertility. Um, and then I would um, advise patient uh, uh, about the typical workup for all those differential. So for ovarian, ovarian reserve would typically obtain um, uh, FSH level and estradiol level uh, in the early follicular phase and also do a pelvic ultrasound to assess for antrophological count. Um, and then for uh, uterine and tubal factors, um, we typically perform imaging studies. It could be done either with a histocalpingogram or a histosonogram um, to look at the to um, to do an intrauterine assessment and also assess tubal patency. All right. So in this case, uh, during that workup, had you found any etiology? Yeah. So um, she was diagnosed with. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, so we know she's not ovulating. You, she also had a history of asymptomatic ovarian teratomas. If somebody has teratomas present on their ovaries and say they're small, uh, does that interfere with ovulation? Uh, not that we know of. Um, okay, all right. So anyway, so we know she's not ovulating, but you did an endometrial biopsy on her that did reveal a polyp in some sort of a, I'm guessing, or was it by ultrasound that you realized there was this polyp in this polypoid endometrium? Yeah, so it was first diagnosed on hysteral sonogram. Okay, uh, on, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you take her to the OR, do a polypectomy, resect the abnormal endometrium, and you get back EIN. Tell me how you counseled her of what that is and what's the implications of those findings? 
Yeah, so that would counsel her that um, this uh, is uh, a, condi a condition that arises from the overgrowth of the uterine lining and is considered uh, a precursor to um, type 1 uh, endometrial cancer and um, has about a 10 to 25% risk of developing into endometrial cancer if not treated. And obviously, um, typically, if it's someone that has completed childbearing, we likely would uh, advise surgical uh, management for EIN. But since she's sitting in front of me desiring um, fertility, uh, we opted to treat uh, with medical management. Yeah, and tell me what dose of medroxyprogesterone acetate you actually put her on, and when are you going to repeat her endometrial sampling? Yeah, so I believe we put her on 20 milligram of medroxyprogesterone acetate daily and um, repeated her sampling um, three months later. Okay, and then do you recall if that was, I mean, I know it was fellowship, but do you recall <laughs> if it was normal by then or would, was somebody else following her up? Uh, I believe someone else uh, was following her at that point. Okay, so when would you start ovulation induction on her? Um, I would say until uh, the resolution of the EIN. Okay, and if she was 40, 48 G4P3 um, had bilateral tubal ligation and had EIN, so you said you would recommend a hysterectomy. If you were a generalist, Dr. Liu, is that something you would do or would you refer her to GYN oncology? Um, I think I would, pref I would refer her to GYN oncology um, just for the possible need of um, sentinel lymph node dissection uh, if, say, on a frozen sample uh, for the hysterectomy, they did find occult disease. Because, yeah, you did talk to me about if untreated, it could, what percentage it could turn into endometrial cancer. But in somebody with EIN, what is the likelihood that they could actually have endometrial cancer right now? Uh, I believe it's fairly high. I want to say 40%. Mm -hmm. Up to 40%. So you are right. So you can't go wrong in the exam by saying anytime you get EIN and somebody who is done with childbearing and desires hysterectomy that you would refer them to GYN oncology. Some of the <laughs> candidates I do mock orals with say their GYN oncs are so crazy busy. They're like, we don't have time to do the EINs, but, but these are people their GYN onks are in the hospital, available to be called in, you know, should the diagnosis of endometrial cancer be determined at that time. So for the exam, I would say you refer all your EINs to GYN onc and why you do it, because of up to a 40% chance they could actually have endometrial cancer and they will get the proper surgery and staging done with that initial surgery. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. and and then what are you going to in um ovu what ovulation induction agent are you going to use and why, Dr. Liu? Uh, so for someone with the like her with the diagnosis of PCOS, we typically choose the letrozole, a an aromatase inhibitor inhibitor for ovulation induction. It's been shown uh, that in the PCOS population, it's more effective and has higher live birth rate. All right, just for my own knowledge too, because I'm a generalist, are you are you guys as REIs, are you getting away from clomiphene altogether or do you still use it in like non-PCOS patients? We still use it um, fairly frequently, like say for unexplained infertility. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if somebody was not ovulating and it wasn't due to PCOS, would you still do clomiphene first or would do you guys like letrozole better? Uh, I've seen a, a mix. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. All right. I don't think there's a uh, preferred. I don't think letrozole okay. is preferred. Like yeah. it's not taking over everything yet. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. 
All right, good. Well, that was good. It was good. Uh, it was good for you just to be asked of something like this. I tried to make it a little bit GYN-ish with the um, the EIN and the management, etc. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Any questions for me? Uh, no, that was a great practice. I was my first time practicing for that case, so thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thanks. All right, so let's see. Anybody else who hasn't gone yet in November who would like to go? Okay, then how about even if you have gone in November, because nobody else wants to volunteer. All right, let's get Jordan. Hey, hey Jordan, I'm going to pull up your cases. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm good. All right. I can't remember. Are you a generalist? I am, yes. Okay, all right. So what case list would you like to do? Um, we can do, what about office? Oh, what about it? Let's do it. All <laughs> right. They, let's see. I'm going to kind of quick flip toward the back because you know what happens all the time as examiners. We just, in the interest of time, we don't want to spend tons of time scrolling through the list. So we kind of grab some of the first couple of things that catch our eyes in the beginning. And so anyway, I need to, oh, let's do, let's do this one. Patient 40, 29 year old G3P0 comes in to see you with a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. Tell me how you define recurrent pregnancy loss and when you would start an evaluation for it. Yeah, so um, recurrent pregnancy loss is uh, three, um, three spontaneous abortions, um, three consecutive spontaneous abortions, but uh, you can start the workup after two. Okay, and so tell me when you're counseling the patient about different causes for recurrent pregnancy loss, walk me through the different causes that you discuss with her. Um, yeah, so um, I'd say sometimes, oftentimes we don't know the exact etiology, but sometimes, but common causes would be um, thyroid or endocrine dysfunction, such as uh, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, um, a karyotype, such as a translocation um, that causes an abnormal karyotype in the fetus, um, uterine anomalies, such as a septate uterus, um, also, I believe, endometrial polyps can increase the risk, um, and a luteal phase defect. Um, are some causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. All right, so then tell me how you're going to evaluate her. Tell, talk to me about the different workup that you did and why you did what you did. Yes, yeah, so um, I start by getting a history, determining, um, determining, you know, when these miscarriages occurred, um, you know, what kind of follow-up happened after them, um, if they happen to get uh, um, a chromosome analysis of the, the tissue um, at any point. Um, I then do a lab evaluation. Um, I start with uh, thyroid and then A1C, um, as, well as, uh, um, as well as a karyotype of both partners. Um, and you can also, I also do antiphospholipid screening as well. Um, I then do an evaluation of the uterine cavity. Um, if I can obtain one, I'll do a sonohis for that. Okay. And in this case, everything came back normal except the septum, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. All right, so then you sent her for septum resection. And so that was done back in July. Um, by any weird chance, have you seen her back yet? Has she conceived yet? Or how um, long do you wait after resection before you recommend attempting conception? Yeah, so she actually moved. Um, so I have not seen her um, okay. back. Uh, I don't know exactly how long you would wait after conception. Um, I would say t at least 12 months. Um, but I'd have to look that up. 
You know, I actually don't know the answer to that either. So um, of what the recommendation is, maybe at the end when we get done doing stuff, maybe Dr. Liu or any of our REIs could tell us what's the recommendation of after you resect a septum, that how long should you wait for optimal healing before the patient attempts conception? Because I think that would be a, a good thing for all of us to know. I've never read anything about that anywhere, Jordan, and that's why I was... Um, really just asking you that. So good. So you talked about genetic, endocrine, structural. You talked about luteal phase defect. And you know, you know, that's one's probably fallen out of disfavor, but we can actually ask our REIs also with that. Like if they have absolutely no definition or no etiology at all, do they ever just give progesterone? You know, kind of like unexplained and fertility we'll mm -hmm. do clomiphene plus IUI so we'll ask them if about that would they just do that the other thing I always try to think about is so genetic endocrine immune you know with the antiphospholipid structural with everything you talked about I always try to put another category called environmental and that would be if the patient's like obese or a smoker just something else to think about since we know those two factors also increase the risk of spontaneous loss Great. But, all right. Perfect. All right. Um, any questions for me? Uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thanks. Let's get Lauren next. Lauren, you're still muted on your end. Hello. There you go. Yep, there you are. How are you? I'm good. How about you? Good. You don't sound too exciting. <laughs> too excited oh, to be here. Tired. Fine. Just, I'm good. Just tired. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so funny. How are you? Fine. Good. All right. <laughs> so we haven't done a are you a general you're a generalist, right? No, I'm actually a GYN oncology fellow. Okay, so you definitely get the OB case list because we haven't done an OB yet. And I know you would just love to do something from your senior residency case, right? <laughs> yeah. You're like, yeah, not so much, but I'll do it. Okay, so let's, have you been asked on cholestasis yet? I actually haven't. Okay, all right. Because I, you know, sometimes if some of the candidates who've been, on the webinars for a while. I don't want to re-ask stuff. So let's do this. Let's look at patient number 19. So she's 29-year-old G4P3, who you gave the diagnosis of cholestasis of pregnancy. Tell me how she presented and how you made that diagnosis. Um, the patient presented with um, significant itching, um, it had been going on for several weeks, and um, the diagnosis was made uh, with bile acids. Okay, so she comes in third trimester, although it can occur earlier, but most of the time it's going to be a third trimester diagnosis. Although they're itching everywhere, tell me what are some other um, uh, symptoms that are it would make you even more tune into a cholestasis, like... Tell me more about um, itching. So it's usually um, like the palms and soles, and sometimes it can be worse um, in the evening times. Um, it's not typically associated um, with a rash, but it can be associated with like um, excoriations from itching. Perfect. Okay, so she comes in and you're pretty sure she's, her clinical picture is consistent with cholestasis. Let's pretend she was 33 weeks gestation when she came in and you made that diagnosis. So what, tell me what you're going to do to confirm that diagnosis. So I would do um, a full set of laboratory workup with a CBC, a CMP. I would want to check liver enzymes and um, bilirubin. Um, I would check her vital signs, her blood pressure specifically, assess for any additional symptoms that may be associated um, with other 
um, conditions, and I would also check bile acids. Okay, and so it may take a while for those bile acids to come back. So you have a patient in front of you, 33 weeks. Um, clinically, she's cholestasis until proven otherwise. What are you going to start for her that day in the office? Um, I would usually, I would start fetal monitoring. Um, I would probably, you know, um, be doing at this point um, bi-weekly um, NST and BPP. Now, bi-weekly, you mean every two weeks or do you mean twice a week? No, I mean twice a week. Okay, so you're going to do twice a week um, antenatal testing, a non-stress test in a BPP. Are you going to do anything to help the mom with her itching? I would... Um, um, I think that um, topical hydrocortisone creams can be uh, utilized. I probably would not start ursodiol unless I actually had made the diagnosis with bile acids, but that may not be. You know, yeah, that I understand may not what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think you you can start it. It's not going to hurt anything. And I think most of us, if the patient was miserable and we, that's clinically what we thought we would start her on it. It may take what five days, maybe even a week to get the bile acids back. What's the worst that happens? You would discontinue it. But what bile acid level does it need to be for you to be able to make that diagnosis? Um, I think in the lab that we were using at the time, it was greater than 10. Okay, perfect. All right, so then you're gonna, what, what were you gonna say? Oh no, nothing. Okay, so we know the mom has too high of bile acids. That's what's getting in her skin. It's causing her to itch. It's all due to the estrogen, the high estrogen levels in pregnancy that you get, that the liver uh, does not properly, it's not clear in clearing and excreting and getting rid of the bile acid. So it's building up in her and causing itching. But why does it affect the fetus? Why are we gonna start doing twice a week testing? The bile acids cross the placenta and they build up in fetal tissues and in the amniotic fluid, which can lead to spontaneous fetal demise. Okay, and so um, if this patient, say, had a bile acid level at 33 weeks of 15, when mm -hmm. are you going to repeat it or are you? I probably would repeat it every two weeks if she's on treatment, um, just because if it's rapidly increasing or if it goes above 100 then that would change my delivery plan excellent okay and yep and then pretty much we like them all delivered by 37 weeks there is some thought that if the bile acids are above 10 and less than 40 and every all the testing looks fine you might be able to go closer to 38 weeks Whereas if it's greater than 100, you're going to be more like 36 weeks. And if it's somewhere in between, but right in that general vicinity, always feel free, Lauren, to say, you know, that um, if it was something odd, like the level was really high, that you would consult the, your MFM and, and go to, to their recommendations. But you are right, 100, greater than 100 is uh, much more severe and we're going to get delivered earlier. And then what about recurrence? I mean, this patient's already had a couple of children. It's not unusual for patients to have had a history of cholestasis in a previous pregnancy. Do you have any idea what's the likelihood of recurrence in a subsequent pregnancy? I believe it's almost, uh, I believe it's very, very high. I would say upwards of 80, per, 60 to 80 percent. That's exactly what I've read. I've read anywhere from 50 to 60 percent and seen even higher up to 80 percent. Can you think of in a non-pregnant patient, so let's say she's a year or so from now, can you think of any medication that you would prescribe to her that could possibly give her a similar type picture with uh, itching without a rash? Itching without a rash. Um, yeah, that would that would give her a cholestasis like picture. Just it wouldn't be cholestasis of pregnancy. This um, is the this is the bonus question. <laughs> 
I don't know. I don't actually. I don't know. I'm trying to think, but maybe a statin. I don't know. Stat it's actually estrogen containing OCPs. Okay. And so it's not a contraindication to give these patients estrogen containing OCPs, but you should know that if you they were on it and they were like, oh, I'm kind of getting that. I feel like I'm kind of itchy again, almost like when I was pregnant. It may be the estrogen component of, in the pill. Okay. All that right. Excellent job, Lauren. I have nothing else to add. Do you have any questions for me? Um, what was I going to say? Um, I don't think so. No. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. So then let's see here. Let me get to make sure I'm getting everybody here. We got Lauren. I talk to myself a lot, just bear with me. Let's get Rita here. And then I'll get Sim Simisola next. Hey, Rita. Hi, good evening, doctor. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. All right, let's see here. Do you have a particular case or case list you'd like to go over? Mm, no. Well, any any case on in my list at this point, yes. Okay, dokie. Let's see. Let's do it. Let's check on office here because everybody hates office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see here. Let's look at patient number 38. This was a good, this was a good um, management on your part. So a 42 year old comes in to see you and is complaining of leakage. Walk me through your differential diagnosis. Uh, when, a, uh, when a patient has a urinary leakage, I have to rule out, uh, my differential would be urinary tract infection. Um, can be mixed urinary incontinence, stress urinary incontinence, or um, uh, neuro, neurogenic bladder. Um, uh, this will be the main uh, things that. Okay, so she comes in, you do your history and physical, and then on physical exam, you noted a second degree cystocele. You did. A UA with urine culture that did reveal a UTI. And just even a UTI can increase urgency, frequency, and urge incontinence, right? Yes. Okay. So then, but you still continued with an additional incontinence evaluation. Tell me how you made the diagnosis of stress incontinence. So during the physical, uh, besides the ur urinalysis, I did um, cough stress test. I did also, I evaluate for uh, urethra hypermobility, uh, also um, bladder, uh, uh, um, to see the, uh, I forget the I so cough stress this um okay. um, um I just forget it. <laughs> um Are you, so describe what you were trying to do. So if you forget the word, tell me what it is you're trying to do. What are you looking for? Scan the bladder to see the the, how much is the uh, the 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 after she boy how much urine is in, in yeah. her bladder? Okay. Perfect. So hit, hit, Rita, just remember that if you get really stuck on the term, so you, I knew you were trying to figure out post void residual. Post -void. Now that's a weird word, but if you really get stuck on like I can't remember the term, just explain to the examiner. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the word, but where you test 
to see after the patient voids how much urine is left in the bladder. And that's okay. So, you know, if you can't think of the word, just describe what it is you're trying to do. Because what isn't, what would be an abnormal post void residual that you would be worried? Uh, over 150. Okay, all right. So in this case, her post void residual must have been normal. She um, had a positive cough test. I, you, she, you must have seen some hypermobility of the urethra. Her UA was negative. Now, did I mean abnormal? You would not have had that culture back for several days, but did you just go ahead and start her on antibiotics based off of an abnormal dipstick? Yes. I okay. Did. All right. So then you started her on the antibiotic. What antibiotic would you typically start someone on? Keflex. Uh, Cephalexin, cephalexin. Okay, um, why that? Um, because uh, it's, uh, the E. coli is uh, sensitive to, to cephalexin uh, usually. Um, okay. Yeah, and it, considering the, the E. coli is the most, one of the most frequent uh, causes of UTI. It is, but let me just go over, it. It, it, especially in pregnancy, that's a good choice. But for non-pregnant patients, the three first-line antibiotics for empiric treatment of a UTI is Bactrim, which is, you know, trimethoprim sulfamizoxazole, um, Macrobid, which is nitrofurantoin, and then this um, antibiotic called phosphomycin. So those are really the first three. So I would consider probably cephalexin to be probably second line. So that the, I would, if they asked you, you can never go wrong with saying back drum or macro bid as uh -huh. your first line um, um, choice. And then of course, you're going to wait till you get the culture back to see um, what it was and if it's sensitive to that. All right. So then you're going to treat the UTI, but now you still have somebody who has stress incontinence. So tell me what lifestyle modifications she can do and um, how does pelvic floor physical therapy help with stress incontinence? Yeah, so basically in terms of lifestyle modification, I encourage um, to, uh, to weigh some low, uh, weigh, low, uh, weigh loss. Uh, also, um, in terms of physical weight loss and um, is a stress urinary incontinence. So, uh, for example, try to avoid um, uh, uh, do kegel ke exercises. Um, and also, I um, refer to physical therapy so uh, the patient can have a, 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 be educated more about how to do. Uh, Good cake here. Okay. Um, yes. All right. So weight loss can absolutely help with stress incontinence. Doing kegels at home, going to pelvic floor physical therapy again to help tighten um, and improve pelvic floor musculature. What if that failed to give her adequate relief? What would be her next options? Mm -hmm. Surgery. Uh, well, if it doesn't work and this uh, is. Um, uh, uh, the patient is, is very stressed uh, out about the issue, and the other option also will be I uh, will try pessary, but uh, otherwise, um, if uh, the patient doesn't want, she can go into surgery. Have me yeah, direct perfect. She could use an incontinence dish pessary, which is one of those ring pessaries with the little knob. She could do that, and you could teach her how to put it in, take it out, etc or she could be referred for surgery. Because do you do your own mid urethral slings? No, I usually, I, I don't do it by myself. I usually refer them or yeah, me too. I'm a generalist. I don't do mid urethral slings either. So that's where you would say, um, if, if she did all these, the, uh, everything you just discussed and that failed to give her adequate relief, you could discuss with her an incontinence dish Pessary, which you could fit her for, teach her how to use, etc., or you would refer her to urology or urogyne for evaluation of a mid urethral sling. Perfect. All right. All right, good. Um, any questions for me? 
No, thank you. Uh huh. All right, let's get Sin Misola next. And let me get. Hello, good evening. Hey, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Good. I don't remember. Are you generalist or are you a subspecialist? I'm a generalist. Okay, so what you dealer's choice? You'll probably you'll be the last one I'll call on tonight. So, what case list do, would you like to do? I guess I haven't done any office. Okay, it's gonna be an office night. All right, so let me kind of go toward the back and work toward the front. <laughs> You poor thing, are you sick? A little bit, yes. <laughs> you know, you just sound nasally and stuffy and that was kind of a yucky cough I just heard. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. It's the season. It is the season, isn't it? What is it? What do they call it? The triple demic right now with RSV yes. and uh -huh. COVID? Mm -hmm. Let's look at this one. This is, would be a good one just to kind of walk through. So you have a 29-year-old G7 P2 who comes into you, positive pregnancy test. She's had a history of an ectopic and had a left salpingectomy. So she comes in, positive pregnancy test. You do a beta HCG that's 957. So at this point in time, you have a pregnancy of an unknown location. So walk me through how you're going to try to figure out where the pregnancy is. Let's do that. How are we going to figure out where the pregnancy is? So tell me how and how you're going to counsel the patient about why you need to follow her up in such in the way that you're going to. Sure. Um, so the biggest thing that we I would want to rule out or be at high suspicion for an ectopic pregnancy. So I usually talk to patients who come in with like either just like some pelvic pain or spotting, bleeding, that this could be just early normal that we're not seeing anything um, in the uterus right now on the ultrasound. Um, however, there is a risk that the pregnancy could be outside of the uterus. And then we talk about the risk for um, rupture and mortality with that. And that's the main reason why they need to follow up so so frequently um and it could also be like an sab right that they just didn't have a confirmed iup prior so um with these patients i expect that if it's a normal pregnancy in uh, um, 48 hours there is an expected increase in the serum beta hcg so that's usually where we start as long as the patient is stable and how um, much would you excuse me how much would you like to see it increase Yes, uh, about 50%, 51. Okay, all right. So now let's take a look at what her stuff did. <coughs> Hers was a little strange. I basically plateaued from the beginning. It was a highly desired pregnancy and she was hemodynamically stable. Um, so then once you got, you got from 957 to almost 1200 to about 1200 at day five. So you could tell her this is not a normal pregnancy, but at Correct. this point in time, you still didn't know where it was. Yes. Okay, all right, so, um, and she's still stable. Uh, so tell me what you, in ultrasound shows no IUP, no adnexal mass. So with this information here, tell me how you counseled her for options for management. Um, so I counseled her that it's definitely an abnormal pregnancy. Um, the ultrasound does not show a clear ectopic, but that's not mean that there isn't one. And um, the my recommendation is to treat for a suspected ectopic because the risks of an undiagnosed ectopic um, getting ruptured would be pretty disastrous. Um, okay, go ahead. And then we talk about, um, I don't usually really bring up expected management for an ectopic because it's just too risky, especially with her beta. 
Um, so we talked about the uh, medical management. Um, and I also mentioned that surgical management usually is more effective if I if I see it on ultrasound. If there's nothing seen in ultrasound, there's uh, un unlikely to see anything um, intra-op. But we could also do a DNC to check for if this was really just an abnormal IUP. Yeah, and so then that, because that was my question there. Since you still don't know where it is before you would give the patient a chemotherapeutic agent, how do you come to grips with that? Like, should I just do a DNC and see if we get chorionic villi and then maybe the beta HCG plummets and I don't even have to give her methotrexate? Yeah, I mean, how, yeah, I mean it's, it's it, tough. It is. And it's usually, um, I make it really patient-centered, um, give them all the information and explain, you know, if we do this and this is what happens. So if we um, go through the DNC route, which is a good recommendation to avoid medication that you don't necessarily need. Um, if we get products, then we're in the clear. If we do not, maybe. then we <laughs> Maybe, that. if it's yeah. not a heterotopic, right, but go ahead. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of my patients actually tend to go with um, getting the medication because um, they don't want to go through getting on anesthesia and going through surgery. Okay, and so then um, if she asked you, well, what if this was just abnormal pregnancy in my uterus? Is the methotrexate going to take care of that too or just the ectopic? How would you explain that to her? So the methotrexate, I, um, I explained that the way it works is that it pretty much um, disrupts any um, fast growing cells, which would include pregnancy in any location. Um, if it was an abnormal pregnancy that is already like a mist, then that could actually, I usually say that the body tends to, um, resorb, um, resorb the tissue. So she would have some bleeding eventually. Um, so what are contraindications to methotrexate? Contraindications to methotrexate pregnant, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, yeah, an IUP, breastfeeding, um, any active liver, uh, liver disease, um, um, active peptic ulcer disease, um, blood dyscrasia, so significant thrombocytopenia or um, leukopenia, um, patients who cannot follow up, because that's really important, um, hemodynamic instability, ruptured ectopic. Those are the okay. absolute indications. All right, so now let's say, because you said this, so now you give her methotrexate, you're going to recheck her beta HCGs on days four and seven, and tell me about how much of a drop you want. Um, so I expect if for um, efficacy that um, between day four and day seven, there is a, at least a 15% decline in the HCG level. If there isn't, then um, I usually will counsel the patient on either an additional dose or we um, choose a different route of management. Okay. All right. So then um, let's say you do get a greater than 15% drop. How often are you going to check the HCGs till they go to zero? Then we would do weekly until it's negative and the pregnancy is completely resolved. Once you've done this, since this was a strongly desired pregnancy, once you've done the methotrexate treatment, you've say, you've watched it go to zero, how long after methotrexate therapy are you going to recommend she wait until attempting conception? So I believe there's no clear guideline, but from what I've read, I counsel my patients to um, use effect. Um, well, most of the time they wouldn't use any, they would just use condoms um, because they're, they want to try soon. I say for two months because of the possible teratogenic effect of any methotrexate that's still in the system. You are right. There are no good guidelines. Initially, we used to say tw you got to wait 12 weeks, you know, till afterwards. And then they're like, ah, maybe you don't need to wait that long. I can't remember right now. I remember reading not too long ago, but what was the half-life of methotrexate? Because it's only a one dose, you know, it's not like they're getting it daily. The half-life was pretty short. And there were some places that said, you know, you probably after 30 days, but in the, 
you know, who wants to take that tiny risk? You know what I mean? But my, right. they said, even after 30 days, it is probably fine. It should be well out of their system. But I think to err on the side of conservancy, and I like the way that you said that, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't know that there's any good data on this. And so, um, but that's maybe what they that what they could ask you. And you could say, I typically wait, they use, recommend they use barrier contraception for two months. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So good. All right, good. That was a good one. Just those pregnancy of unknown locations. Those are the tough ones. Any okay. questions for me? Um, the part about um, the DNC, was that sufficient? I mean, that is really what happens with my patients. Yeah, no, it, it is fine because you just say, hey, look, we could do a DNC. And if we get back chorionic villi, I'm still going to follow an HCG because you still got to prove it's not a heterotopic, right? But yeah. and if, if, if the HCG goes to zero, then we're done and you didn't have to take a medications. On the other hand, if I get no tissue, then we're going to have to turn around and do methotrexate anyway. Okay. I mean, Thank because you. that's basically what it is, is. So it's really sitting down and talking with the patients and doing shared decision making. And that's you right. are right. The longer we put off the treatment, the longer the increased risk that an ectopic, you know, it could rupture. Yeah. All right. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lower everybody's hand and then I'm going to see if one of our REIs wants to answer and say, OK, so. I want to know luteal phase defect. It, do, do you even consider that anymore? Let me get Dr. Lou. And then how long should we, hey, Dr. Lou, and then how long should we wait after we resect a septum before they can conceive? Um, so after septum resection, typically we put in like an intrauterine balloon uh, for like five days and then put them on estrogen, PO estrogen you, just to help mm -hmm. regenerate the lining. And then the following cycle, we would do a histosonogram just to make sure that um, the septum is um, sufficiently treated, resected, and then they should, uh, then we start them on treatment. Um, okay, so 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 basically it's, all, it's at least six to weeks, maybe almost eight weeks by the time they've had yeah. The cycle that they're in with the balloon in the oral estrogen, the following yeah. month they get their HSG, and then the month after that they can conceive. Okay, good. So tell mm -hmm. us tell us about the recurrent pregnancy loss in the um, luteal phase defect. I, yeah. I haven't used Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it is something that we kind of tell them as an intervention that doesn't necessarily have a, late, a lot of data behind, but we could do uh, once they get pregnant. Um, we, you know, not just trend the ACG, we also trend the progesterone and then treat uh, if it's low. Okay. <laughs> like and that. what do you... And what would you like, if somebody's pregnant, what do you want, the, when would you consider adding in supplemental progesterone? What serum progesterone level? Yeah, um, and like and among the faculty I work with in my program, I've seen various treatment threshold. <laughs> I've seen like 10, 15, some people even go up to 20. <laughs> So it kind of just yeah. so there's no standard yeah. absolutely. So this is this is one of those things. It's no standard. It's like what's what is progesterone going to hurt? Nothing. If you check a progesterone, and in 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 the REI that you work with, if in their eyes it's low-ish, they'll right. supplement. And it doesn't sound like it's a whole lot more scientific than that right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, thank you for um your information we appreciate it of course thanks uh-huh all right guys that is it for tonight so anyway uh have a good weekend oh wait janelle's got a question janelle are you there hi yeah uh, i'm i'm here did um, you have a question yeah i was just wondering i've actually never Placed a pessary for incontinence. I've, I've done it for pelvic organ prolapse, but I was just wondering if, like, the fitting is the same or is there any difference with how you it's, fit? 
It's 100% the same. All it is, it just has a little knob on it. So it gives a little bit of extra upward pressure where the urethra is. So you truly fit it the same way. You kind of put your fingers in, try to check to see like what diameter put you. You could just fit her with any type of a ring pessary. And then when you ordered it, you would order that same size, but with the little knob. And the knob should be upwards underneath the urethra. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thanks. All right, good. All right. I think, let me see here. Rita, did you have one last question? Oh, yeah. Uh, in terms of pessary, uh, sorry, in terms of the, the, yeah, the pessaries, how do you choose a pessary? What's your thing, uh, technique? How do you choose? Yeah, most of the time we're going to use a ring pessary for like second and third degree prolapse, at least especially for sure second degree prolapse. The rings are the easiest to put in. They're the easiest to take out. Patients can do it, etc. Somebody who has complete prosodentia and is not sexually active, that would be a patient who the gel horn um, is probably going to be the only thing that's going to really hold it up and in, in place. Now, I do, uh, there's other pessaries that I've done, um, but I think for the exam, if you just know a ring pessary, you know an incontinence dish pessary and a gel horn, and that's primarily used for complete prosodentia, and in, you really can't have intercourse with that in place. I, I think that would be plenty to know. Okay, thank you so much. Uh-huh. All right, I'm going to call it tonight because it's already almost 945. All right, guys, so um, happy Sunday. <laughs>